people ask me sometimes why I went into family medicine, and my answer always is it's the liberal arts approach to medicine. I have found that I'm absolutely, unabashedly a uh, jack of all trades, a master of none, proud of it. Um, I love being a generalist. I love thinking broadly and widely and deeply. And my background in the liberal arts absolutely trained me for that. So I um, cannot be a bigger booster of the liberal arts, I think. Um, the title of my talk, and as I'm hearing the, the biography and the stories, I'm very happy that I've kind of crafted my talk the way I did um, because I think it's going to really echo many of the themes that you heard. And the title is Creativity in Medicine. And I think that many of you, and I have to ask, I have to pause just for a moment. How many of you are in AED, the Pre-Med Honor Society? Okay, so there's a few people here. They heard me. I gave the, a title or a talk with the same title. Uh, it's a completely different talk. So I will not be repeating uh, too many things here today. But I think many of you in the audience are probably wondering, like, creativity and medicine? It doesn't sound like those two words go together very well. I don't think of medicine as being a very creative enterprise, and I'm hoping to convince you otherwise of that, because this is, this is kind of my passion now, actually. I'm, I'm giving this talk to different groups. I'm giving it to my colleagues coming up, and I was asked to sort of try and inspire them, because a lot of my colleagues in the trenches, as we call it, are a little disenchanted these days with medicine. And I think that if we shift how we think about it, we can re-energize ourselves and I think improve medicine in the process. So I could have easily called this talk communication in medicine or curiosity in medicine or the liberal arts in medicine, but decided to go with creativity in, instead. And I'll kind of explain my idea and be, uh, behind this as the talk unfolds here. So I have a disclaimer, but before I give this disclaimer that I was planning to give, I'm going to give one that I wasn't planning to give, and that is, um, I'm sure I'm breaking all kinds of um, public speaking rules. Like, I have a lozenge in my mouth right now. I woke up at 3.30 this morning with a really bad cough, and um, knock on wood, I think singers tell me that when they go on stage and they've had a cold, that they kind of go on adrenaline. It's like a shot of primatine mist, um, and so I'm going to see if my natural primatine mist uh, helps me out, so I'm feeling pretty good. But if I cough, I'll try and not cough in the microphone, and, and I have lozenges for anyone else who might need one here. But my official disclaimer then is that when I say medicine, what I really mean is healthcare. But I'm a physician, and so I'm going to be speaking to you from my position as a family practice physician. So I know many of you are pre-pharmacy or going into perhaps veterinary medicine or dentistry or nursing or public health. So just keep that in mind that when I say medicine, I really mean healthcare broadly. And the second piece of that is that when I say physician, I'm really thinking healthcare provider. And I, when I do my work on NPR, I'm extremely, some people would fault me um, for trying to be so politically correct that I, I often will substitute provider instead of physician. Um, but I'm very aware of the fact that there are nurse practitioners and, and physician assistants and nurse midwives who do the same kind of stuff that I do. And I I, have, I embrace it, actually, and so I am very careful with how I phrase these words. So what I'm going to start with is this, and I think any of you who are going into the health sciences know this. And in fact, this statement that there is great emphasis on the science of medicine really shapes your academic careers, and sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm saddened by that. It shaped mine. I was a chemistry major out of convenience. I... I, I <laughs> I didn't love chemistry. Um, in fact, I wonder in hindsight, like, why and how did I get through that? How did I get through physical chemistry? It's beyond me. But anyway, I did it because it actually allowed me then this great opportunity to take and dabble, frankly, in a lot of other liberal arts courses. And I took, I think, had my college, had St. Olaf offered a minor, I would have minored in English, possibly in religion, probably in biology. I had sort of concentrations in those areas. Um, but there's this emphasis on science, the science of medicine, for a good reason. Um, I mean, think of, think of world history. Think of how since the late 1800s with Pasteur and Robert Cook and the germ theory and the elucidation of the fact that plague isn't caused by the wrath of God, it's caused by a microbe and that there's actually a way to kill that microbe. I mean, the course of human history has changed through scientific discovery. And, you know, the, the public's health, our health, has improved because of vaccine development and surveillance and stuff that, frankly, it's very numbers-driven. Um, we practice biomedicine in this country, by and large. I mean, yes, there's more and more emphasis on complementary alternative medicine, but it's still the Western sort of biomedical model that we practice here, which is, you know, based on the scientific method that there's cause and effect. Um, 
you know, and, and also I think to great benefit of us, to patients, is that there's a new uh, emphasis on patient safety and monitoring how we do things. And then sort of a companion to that is that there's this huge emphasis on evidence-based medicine. And I'm acutely aware of this, that if I have a patient with high blood pressure, based on what we know about populations, I should be doing X, Y, either and or Z. And if I don't do that, I might actually get in trouble for that because I'm not following guidelines. So it's kind of gotten to that in some respects. Um, and then it's interesting too, is that because we live in this technologically, scientifically driven sort of society and, and, and its emphasis on healthcare, we've got these great tools, these great toys, and we all want them. We all want that implantable whatever, and we want to go through that whatever scan that is that, that looks at my heart and the, the calcified vessels, and this is cool stuff. And anyone who's ever been to the Mayo Clinic or gone for an executive physical, I mean, there's no orifice left unexplored when you, when you come out of there, because we can do it. But that's not very cost effective, and it's not always the best thing to do. And it's, you know, we wonder why we spend such a huge part of our country's dollars on, on um, health care, there's a, there's a reason behind that. Um, but at the same time, then the evidence-based medicine side of things might be able to help us kind of do cost containment. So it might be sort of our salvation in a way, too, to try and rein things in. So, and obviously, there are limits to what science can explain. No matter how technologically advanced we've become, there's still this mystery of life. There's still, I mean, how do you explain attraction? How do you explain the feelings that we have when we're ill, when we're well, anxiety, stress, the mind, the, 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 the mind-body connection. So there's just, you know, no matter how much we know about the human genome, no matter how much we sequence things, or how good our CAT scans are, the functional MRIs that can now see, like how, can't see thoughts, but it can see where you're making those thoughts. I mean, it's really mind-boggling. Um, but what I do like to share is a, a poem that this physician poet he sort of makes this very, very obvious and very clear. And this poem is called MRI of a Poet's Brain. And it's by a guy named Vernon Rowe, who is a neurologist. And it's from this collection called um, Blood and Bone, Poems by Physicians. So what I'm going to read to you, it, it's, this is kind of what a report would read like from a radiologist who's looked at someone's brain, and you're going to hear all these sort of Latin, Greek terms. So don't worry about what they mean. And you'll see in a sec here just why I'm using this poem. So Vernon Rowe's poem. MRI of a poet's brain. In this image of your brain, I see each curve in the corpus callosum, curlicues of gyri, folding of fissures, sinuous sulci, mammillary bodies, arcuate fasciculus, angular gyrus, tracts and nuclei, eyes and ears, tongue and pharynx, but not even a single syllable of one tiny poem. And I think that's just beautiful, the image that he kind of creates there about the, the limit of technology and the limit of science to some extent. So there's certainly this, you know, less emphasis is on, is placed on the art of medicine, both in training and in practice. And I, you know, how do I, do, how do I decide this? But in medical education, I'm going to guess that if we took the curriculum, especially in the first two years, and we said, what percentage of it is based on sort of the science of medicine, microbiology, gross anatomy, histology, you know, the list goes on. I think it's, and I, and I know this to some extent because I teach the students part of the art part. I'm going to guess it's a 90-10, 9-1 to, 10, 9 to 1 ratio, something like that. 90% of the coursework is on sort of stuff, you know, data, uh, things to be memorized. And then 10% is the softer stuff, if, if you put it that way. And then in practice, I mean, I was just trying to think about this this morning when I was seeing my 12 patients or so. I'm going to guess it's at least 50-50 art and science of medicine. Although I think this morning it was about 80% art and 20% science. It was just this <laughs> one person after the other was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help you because your problems are not easily fixable. And um, they're societal in nature. And you're getting old. And things aren't working like they once did. And I can only do so much with my drugs. So today was a little bit more skewed, I think, than it would be otherwise. So when I say the art of medicine, I think it's worth talking about what do I mean by that? Maybe we all have some sense of what that means, but I think it's important to sort of talk about it. So my working definition of the art of medicine is that it's everything that makes medicine humane medicine. And I, I almost left it as it's everything that makes medicine medicine. But I'm guessing that everybody in this room has had an experience with a doctor or some kind of a healthcare provider where whatever makes that person, you know, 
important and special somehow got left outside the door that day. You know, that it is possible to practice medicine with very little compassion, with very little listening, with really not making a connection with somebody. It's entirely possible to practice like that. I don't know how you do it, and I'm not sure that person's going to last very long, both professionally just from a, from a grounding standpoint, and also that kind of person's probably going to get in trouble at some point with a hospital board or medical practice or something, but, but it can happen. So I, I inserted the word humane medicine. And so what I'm getting at is the art of medicine is communication. It's making that connection. It's speaking the same language. And I don't mean if you s literally speak different languages, but somehow trying to make that connection. You enter a room, and within seconds, sometimes it's even less than seconds, you're sensing the person that's in there, and you're trying to make a connection, and you've got to sense it right away. You've got to make that connection and, and, and communicate. It's about things like kindness and caring. It's actually, um, there was a guy named Pibbity um, in the East Coast, and he said years ago in the New England Journal, I think it was, he said, the secret in caring for the patient is in caring for the patient. Actually, like, caring about the people that you're taking care of, not just, you know, going through the room. You actually have to care for people. Um, empathy feeling, trying to experience in a way what they're going through. Not just sympathy, not just kind of superficial, but actually sort of feeling what it must feel like to have lost a child, to have lost a parent, to be diagnosed with diabetes, to have a cancer diagnosis, to be going through the treatments and things uh, all, all of that nature. Um, it's about trust. It's about having a bond and feeling like you can have a conversation and communicate and actually trust one another and understanding. And then I think importantly, it's about the application of knowledge. Um, I can't, I've got so many colleagues who are brilliant. I mean, brilliant people. And I can say this because I'm not a great standardized test taker, and a lot of my colleagues are way better about that than I am, and they've always been better. But I'm not sure that I want to see a lot of them as my, as my doctor um, because they don't know what to do with that knowledge. They, they're so smart that their smartness sometimes get in, gets in the way of good clinical judgment, and so they order every test possible because it could be a thousand different conditions, whereas I'm thinking, you know, it could be all these other things, but most likely it's this, and let's try this. So it's the application of knowledge. So to kind of break this down a little bit, just to look at the two side by side, the art and science of medicine. So the art is the stuff that's quote unquote soft, and, and I mean, I can certainly argue it's actually the stuff that's hard, but let's just say for the sake of argument, it's sort of the soft stuff. It's, it's the stuff that's hard to measure and quantify. Um, it's sort of like, pardon this, but you know, everyone's sort of like, well, what's the definition of pornography? Well, you know it when you see it. And I think that the art of medicine is like, you kind of know it when you see it. You know if somebody's a good practitioner of the art of medicine. Um, and it's very hard to define. It's very hard to teach. How do you teach empathy? How do you teach someone to care if they don't come to medical school or nursing school or pharmacy school with that sort of hardwired already? So people have often argued that you can't teach it. You have to model it. You have to sort of be an example for people. Um, it's very hard to test. I mean, I, we do this. We have these OSCE exams where we have a fake clinic below my real clinic, and people come in, and you know, there's a fake patient, and, and it's <laughs> like you're, you're getting tested, and you're being videotaped and recorded, and I'm sitting in the corner evaluating. I mean, it's very hard to do, because how realistic is that? Well, you know, it is what it is, and it's what we got. It's also hard to fund, and this is a big deal these days. It's very hard to get dollars to pay people to just teach and to teach, like, communication skills and that stuff. So on the other side, we've got science. So this is, the, this is the hard stuff. This is the empiric stuff. This is the data side. Relatively easy to measure or quantify. Anyone who's taken statistics might argue that, but I think that in some level it's, it's, it's easy to quantify. You can tabulate it. You can view it. It's easier to teach. It's pretty easy to throw up some PowerPoints with some data and just expect students to, to memorize it, regurgitate it, give them a multiple choice test, see if they retained it enough to get through the test. I mean, so it's relatively easy to teach easy to test, and it's fundable. I mean, this is where the dollars, the medical school, kind of the engine that drives the academic health center, which helps drive the U, it's about research dollars. I mean, it's, it's, this is where the millions of dollars are. It's in science. It's in new discoveries and breakthroughs. So how do we, how do we reconcile these sort of obvious differences? Well, in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, interestingly, about the same time that f general practice was becoming family medicine, there was this, there were a bunch of new schools being built, much like there are right now, if you're kind of following the news, a number of states and kind of sort of second tier colleges are now creating medical schools in Florida and just all over the place. 
because of this sort of unmet, the sort of perceived need for more physicians in the, in the years to come to care for our aging population. But in the 1960s, a similar thing was happening. Um, Hershey, Pennsylvania was a good example. Penn State's med school started there. So as these places were being developed, they thought, you know what, we're starting over in a way. Let's create something different. And so this, this movement of medical humanities came about, and, about, and it was also paralleling all these new advances and in, in this, this very nascent field of bioethics that really hadn't existed before. It was now kind of coming into the fore, and there was this sort of natural linkage. And it was all an effort to sort of humanize what was often felt to be a brutal medical school experience. And so what was happening then is you got literature props, you got people with PhDs going to medical schools and teaching and using novels and short stories and texts and trying to, you know, reiterate this idea that the, the patient is a person, that the chart can be seen as sort of a text, you know, it's a story of the person's life and or lives. Um, they were reading classics of medical literature, things like um, Death of Ivan Ilyich by Tolstoy and Albert Camus' The Plague. and I mean, these kinds of books were being used. And also they were studying a lot of doctor writers. So William Carlos Williams, sort of the, the godfather of American poetry, was a pediatrician, general practitioner, poet, uh, writer. Um, then, you know, poetry in the med school, films and film clips. There's this whole idea of like using little clips from films to sort of show certain scenes. Um, there was you know, drama, dramatic readings, readers' theater being done, being done currently. Literary journals started popping up, and there's one out of the University of Virginia that's online. It's called Hospital Drive. So, th you know, they're kind of embracing the new technology. Um, so all of this is sort of happening. And then, of course, you have the philosophers, the PhDs in philosophy coming into the med schools and really focusing on bioethics, this emerging field, because more and more, I mean, even in the 1960s, late 60s and into the 70s, they're starting to see these issues of, what do we do? We can now keep people alive, but are they really alive? They didn't say if they wanted to live like this, what do we do? And so a lot of these big, big issues were coming into play at that time. So then the question that everyone always asks is, the evaluators is, well, okay, so that's great, but does it work? Does it actually make you know, better physicians, more empathetic healthcare providers? And the answer is that it's, it's really hard to know. It's not clear. How do you prove, you know, causation, cause and effect? How do you show that this person was this way when they came in, but look, through this intervention, they've actually gotten better? It's basically impossible to do this. And so there are many, many skeptics, not surprisingly, many of them from the basic sciences who just sort of don't get this thing, and they want their, they want their time carved out for their lectures, um, understandably. So, um, and then when you use the words like art and humanities in the med school curriculum, people are really kind of like get nervous about that. Like, what is this all about? And I will, I can, I'm speaking from experience being the, the co-director of the, the Center for Arts and Medicine. Uh, and it's gone through some different name changes and incarnations over the last uh, couple years. So I think it's important to remind ourselves that it's not a question of art or science. It's art and science. I mean, I really, think that we have to sort of reframe this and, and remind ourselves of this, that it's, it's not an either-or thing. And as Sir William Osler, um, one of the founding fathers of American medicine, he was at Johns Hopkins before that, I think he'd been at McGill in, in Montreal, say that medicine is the most humanistic of the sciences and the most scientific of the humanities. And I, I love that. I mean, it's, we can argue about whether that's true or not, but I love that sort of idea that this, this equal blend of things. Um, a friend of mine, Raphael Campo, is a uh, Guggenheim award-winning poet, physician at um, one of the Harvard-affiliated uh, hospitals in Boston. And about three years ago, two and a half years ago, he wrote this article. He had just come back from London. An international conference on medical humanities had been held there. And he was thinking about this whole experience he'd had and, and very much the kind of the reflection that I'm going through right now, too. Like, what are we doing? I mean, is it really working? Is it, is it worth it? And ultimately, he thinks it is. And then he even like sort of thought about the term, you know, like this idea of how do you, you know, this medical humanity. He's like, well, I guess we should call it that because we don't have a better term. We don't have a better idea. And after reading this and thinking about it a lot, and because I really feel like this is part of my life blood, my life work, um, I really wonder if creativity might be a better term than medical humanities. Um, and I'm going to explain, can spend part of the, the, the next part of my talk explaining why this is. And I think that this can be less offensive to a lot of people if we were to frame it this way. And, and this is kind of the, the crux of my idea, that medicine is inherently a creative endeavor. And you may be wondering, like, well, how is that possible? And I know 
I had to think through that. I know a lot of my colleagues had to think through that. And let me explain it in three different ways why I think that's so. In patient care, I knock on a door and I walk in. I may know this person or I may not know this person. But within seconds, I have to sort of get a sense of what's happening in that room. I'm, I'm getting a, a visual spread. There's two kids over here running around. Mom's, you know, got her back to me. She's not turning around even though I say hello. Person over here is shaking like a leaf, um, not making eye contact. Somebody's breathing really hard and looks a little blue in the lips. I mean, within seconds, you're making a decision about kind of what's happening. Um, you're talking to the patient. You realize that they don't have a college education. They're from another country. Um, there's an interpreter. They're hard of hearing. So you're instantly adjusting your communication style to make it work. Then you make a diagnosis. And you're trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to get this person who really hates to take drugs, take this drug? They really need to be on insulin. They really need to be on something for their diabetes. So every step of the way is this creative kind of right brain thing that's going on in my head, in, in all of your heads, working with the left side, so the an analysis, but then the context, or the text and the context, and trying to make this all work. And it's really hard work, but it's incredibly satisfying. And I'm, I'm sure this applies to many, many professions and many, many jobs, every encounter, every meeting we have. But it happens every 15 minutes in medicine or every 25 minutes or whatever your schedule is when you're seeing somebody. It's just constantly happening, and it's incredibly satisfying. So that's patient care. And then, I mean, isn't research all about innovation? Isn't, isn't the essence of research like coming up with a great new idea? Like, what really is behind Alzheimer's? You know, is it this amyloid protein, or is there something else going on? Is the amyloid protein actually responding to some sort of irritant? You know, it's a protein or a, or a prion or something else that's going on. You know, Karen Ash here is doing this just, she's got this, like, mind-blowing idea of what's behind Alzheimer's. Well, that's totally cool. It's completely about innovation and creativity and coming up with a new idea. So this is where I think, like, the researcher types can really kind of speak that same language about creativity. And then finally, education. And these, by the way, are the three sort of pillars of medical schools. If you go to the Mayo Clinic, they have three shields that sort of, you know, is emblematic of what they're about. And it's this. It's patient care, research, and education. And education, here at our medical school, the hope is that in 2010, that we're going to basically completely change how we go about training doctors of the future. This is the idea of Med 2010. And, you know, we're constantly, my colleagues who are really, really big into education are always thinking about how can we do this better? How can we evaluate it better? So there, too, they're thinking creatively. They're thinking innovatively. So just to remind ourselves, I, I looked this up in the American Heritage Dictionary that's next to my desk at home. And creative refers to, you know, having the ability or power to create. And the example it gives us human beings are creative animals. And then the third definition was characterized by originality and expressiveness, imaginative. And finally, they use an example of a noun, that one who displays productive originality. And in the world of medicine where I'm measured on my productivity, I really like that, that productive originality. I've got to figure out a way of kind of working that so I can satisfy my bosses, my the number crunchers. So for creative ideas in medicine, I won't pose this to you broadly, but this is probably my one sort of audaci aud audacious um, idea that people are really going to scratch their heads about. But the funny thing is, in, in medicine historically, when people are seeking solace, they're seeking ideas, they're seeking comfort, and they want to be inspired, they've typically turned to, to the arts. I mean, poetry, painting, literature, music. But I've lately been turning uh, to business, <laughs> um, to business books to be specific. And I, I'm going to give you some examples of this. And I'm... I'm absolutely, and I mentioned this to the students I saw last fall, early on I had some interest in this area, but I've since read, I think, probably a dozen books along this line, and I think I actually need to read the novel again one of these days. But you've probably all heard about um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, The Tipping Point. He had another one that came out, Blink. These are kind of classified as business books. And like, why is it? They're idea books, but they're kind of often shelved in business. So he really kind of started a lot of this resurgence, I think, in big bold, cool ideas coming from the business world. Um, has anyone read this book, A Whole New Mind? I'm just curious if anyone. If I can recommend one book to you, um, I've got 10 recommendations coming up. This is not one of them, but I've got it up here if you want to look through it. This book really um, has changed the way I think about things. And I read this, and the subtitle here is Why White Brainers Will Rule the Future. It's by Daniel Pink. He's actually coming here as part of a great conversation series um, in June, I think it is. And 
so the, he talks about this conceptual age coming up, that we're sort of entering this new age. We've gone from sort of the, the industrial revolution or the agricultural era, the industrial revolution, and we're even now kind of getting beyond the sort of information age. I mean, we now have at our fingertips any piece of information you want. We can instant, you know, ac instant access. If we want to look right now and figure out what the temperature is in Brussels, we could probably figure it out, or who the prime minister of Iceland is. I don't have to memorize that anymore. I can just look it up. So what's the next age? What's this next step that we're heading into? And he kind of calls it this conceptual age. And people who think with their right brains, not just the right brain, but, but can integrate the right with the left, that the text plus the context is key. And he talks about these six senses that we should develop. And I'm all over this. I, I think this is such a cool idea that the design, the way things look, the, the space that we're in, this is hugely important. The story, a person's story, the telling of stories becomes essential in what we do. And he, use, he even uses medicine as an example of that, narrative medicine. The idea of symphony, not orchestra hall, not the Minnesota Orchestra, not the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, but the idea of bringing disparate people together to make something beautiful. And isn't that a great metaphor of what we do in a clinic? I mean, it's all interprofessional. It's the front desk person, it's the billing person, it's the nurse, it's the CMA, it's the doctor, it's the nurse practitioner. We're all working to sort of make this happen. Um, the other example he uses there are people who have hyphens in their titles, like physician poet, physician artist, nurse writer, and, and, and these people who kind of live firmly in two worlds. And it's, it's all about liberal arts. Um, empathy, the importance of sort of helping one another, listening to one another, um, feeling other people's perspectives and situations, the importance of play. When is the last time that you ever thought of like medical school being fun? Um, never. I mean, it's not fun. It's, 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 right, it's not a fun experience. Even people who try and get through and they do okay, they would probably not pick that as one of the adjectives that they would use when describing their, their experience you know, four years later. Um, but why not? Why is med school not like a giant Nova exper you know, experience? So why is it not like this mind-blowingly cool experience when you're there realizing, I'm hearing from this world expert on Alzheimer's. Why is that lecture so boring? Um, why is it that that neuroscientist is making me memorize all these things about you know action potentials and sodium and potassium channels and you know whatever? I mean, how can that not be? How can we not make that interesting when we're talking about the brain and all the ways that it works? So it's just it's very interesting, and I think that we're going to see some change there. And then finally, his other six senses: meaning and the importance of just feeling like you 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 love what you do. You're you're rooted in this, and it it gets you up every morning. And healthcare. You know, I mean, many people would probably love their jobs, but I will tell you that in healthcare, it is so hard sometimes. But I never go home at night, and I never go to work in the morning thinking that what I'm doing is useless, or I wonder why I'm doing what I'm doing. It has meaning, and that's one of the great things about healthcare. Well, quickly, one of the other books there, right after the one I read, is, is this one called Made to Stick, and how can I not get a book that looks like it has duct tape on the cover? Um, it's by these two brothers, and their idea is there's this acronym called SUCCESS, and it's the important, or they talk about the, the key to having simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, empathetic stories is in ways of getting your messages across. And I thought, oh, this is so applicable in medicine. When a person comes to me with eight complaints, that's not a simple, concrete, credible story. That is like overwhelming. And then I'm trying to comment on each of those ten, eight different things. Nothing happens during that visit because it's just, there's nothing simple, there's nothing concrete. I can't solve anything. Um, so this is just, you know, another example. And also, any of you who are interested in, you know, volunteering, starting a, a free clinic, a book like this just gets you thinking in all these ways, like how do you sell people on your idea that could change the world? So another really inspiring book. This is my favorite non-medical journal, medical journal, the Harvard Business Review. It reads beautifully. It's got fantastic articles. One in here was, um, it was a different voice column. It was called Creativity Step by Step, a conversation with choreographer, choreographer uh, Twyla Tharp. And it's this very interesting article. And here is a business journal talking to a dancer. When's the last time that happened in JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine? Not very often, but I think that those journals could learn a lot. And then this, for any of the um, slightly older folks in the audience will appreciate, this is called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. And under the, the sort of uh, subtext there is A Corporate Fool's Guide to Surviving with Grace. And the idea is that many of the institutions we work in, not to say the University of Minnesota, but um, some places just get so bogged down with details that you get, you get stuck in these committees and this, this hairball effect. And what you need to do is sort of orbit. You need to sort of 
get around this. And this has actually become kind of my guiding principle for the next five years. I'm starting next fall, I'm opening a new clinic with, through the University of Minnesota across from the Guthrie. And it's going to be a primary care clinic. But I'm thinking, like, oh, it's just beautiful. It's like I'm off campus just enough, so I'm kind of outside the hairball, and I can kind of exist in this sphere and, and sort of thrive. And so I'm actually taking this crazy book uh, very much to heart. So what can you do to be a better, you know, fill in the blank, pharmacist, nurse practitioner, midwife, physician, and many of you in the room who are not in healthcare could probably insert a word there as well. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to share with you quickly 10 ideas I've got. And... Um, I'm using the Heath Brothers idea. I'm going to give you some simple, unexpected, concrete, credible ideas. I'll tell you in stories a little bit. Um, this is not meant to be some sort of hierarchy of what I think is important. But I think for those of you students who you know, are, are, are here and you're listening and you're hoping maybe there's a little inspiring thing that can come from this, I hope this is, I hope that the, this is that part. So I have a second disclaimer for you. And that is simply that these are things that have really worked for me. And um, one of the joys of being able to give a talk like this is that I can kind of do something a little out of the box. I didn't have to fill out some form where you're going to learn three objectives from this, this talk like I do it with my medical colleagues. So this, uh, thank you for indulging me because this allows me a chance to do something a little, well, definitely out of the box. And these are all things that have fed and feed my soul. And I hope that these are things that might feed your soul a little bit. So um, as I get into the tent, let me give you one quick story. When I was, I was probably 20 years old, I suppose, I was probably my sophomore year of college, so I was just turning 20. Um, I came up to the university with a couple colleagues of mine. All, all three of us, by the way, have become physicians, very different paths that we've taken, but two were a year ahead of me in college, and I was the younger of the three, and we were all in the band together, and we came up on a wintry day to hear about getting into med school. And this wonderful goofy, crazy guy named Al Sullivan, and some people in the room might remember him, but I believe he was like dean of students at the medical school for a while, and he signed my letter of acceptance, and so I think partly because of that, and he crossed out my, you know, Mr. Hallberg and put John, and so I, I've got this, like, amazing letter at home that I got into med school, and I can tell you exactly where I was when I got that letter. Um, he totally, like, irritated and blew everybody in the room away when he said, and here are the three majors that are the best majors to get into medical school. You're probably all thinking, okay, biochemistry, chemistry, or biology. No. He said, um, the first one, Greek. Um, you know, it's the language of medicine. So what could be better than understanding, you know, where, where, where it has come from? Number two, uh, anthropology. To study humans, to study the human condition, to sort of get inside, experience other cultures. And the third one was history that, you know, instead of, you know, how do we move forward and under, we need to understand the past, we don't want to repeat the past, we need to know where we've come from. So everyone in the room is like, what the heck, you know, we're all like chemistry, biology, biochemistry majors, and this guy just seemed like he was just crazy. And um, turned out he spoke like five languages, he went to University of the South, uh, Suwannee it's also called, he was just a southern gentleman, just really interesting and a very inspirational person to me personally. So. Number one, my first thing is, and this is something you can't, I can't give you, I can't put on a list and have you work on this. I think you have to come to the table with this. But you need a strong sense of curiosity and a passion for something. And I kind of lump those two ideas together. But you've got to, you've got to have a thirst for knowledge. And I'm hoping that being in liberal arts that you have that. But you just, I'm hoping that all of you are not content with just the assignment. You want to go further or deeper or you segue a little bit and you kind of, have this, you know, bumper experience where you go from one thing and bounce to another. It, it's so, it's so important and it's so fulfilling and it's so interesting when you do that. And I'm going to, so either I'm quoting Robin Williams or Walt Whitman or both, but um, if anyone's, if any of you have seen The Dead Poets Society, it's one of my favorite films. I think it actually, it's another story for some other day, but I think that movie actually kept me in med school and I was almost ready to quit. But he, Robin Williams leans over these boys in one scene of the movie and he says, boys, suck the marrow out of life. And it was sort of right up there with Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. And there's something to be said. I love that picture. Just suck the, suck the marrow out of what life has to offer for you. Um, Tom Friedman, many of you may know about this book, The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century, came up with this interesting equation. So this is not math. It's not physics. But it's CQ plus PQ greater than IQ. And what this stands for is that the curiosity quotient plus something he's calling a passion quotient outdoes or is more important than the intelligence quotient. And for somebody who's, again, not a great standardized test taker, 
I love this. And this is, uh, I needed to hear this many years ago. But I will tell you, in the practice of medicine and in the practice of healthcare, honestly, I think that this really counts for a lot. And he's really on to something. And he and Daniel Pink have been kind of doing this tag team thing about what's going to happen in the 21st century and where we're headed with things. So second thing, a little self-serving maybe, but if you don't listen to national public radio, I think you should. And, and if you're from Minnesota, it's really NPR that you're going to be listening to. And I'll, and I'll state my case. Um, Terry Gross is probably the best interviewer out there. She makes David Letterman look so bad in terms of you know, how he goes about things. So if that's your idea of how you interview a patient or you know, ask questions and take an interest in somebody, please listen, to, look up Fresh Air, listen to Terry Gross. She's amazing. Um, any of you know This American Life, Ira Glass, kind of a goofy, crazy guy, but it gives you this amazing sense of Americana and people that populate this country in the quirky ways that they think, and it's, a, and it's very much in tune with kind of a younger vibe of what's happening in this country, and it's just so well produced. Something called StoryCorps, an amazing thing. Dave Isay uh, got a MacArthur Genius Grant for having these booths, basically, where people go and tell their stories to one another and they record these things. Um, I actually get a weekly email link that I then turn to on Friday or Saturday to listen to like the latest installation. Unbelievable. Um, the Writer's Almanac, I actually get this every morning as a daily email because I don't listen to the classical side of NPR. And it starts with a poem. And then he goes on to this whole thing about like what happened that day in history. And it's everything from the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which just began, I think, two, two, you know, two or three days ago. It was the, the you know, 60th anniversary of that. Um, today there was something was Rudyard Kipling or who it was, but I every day learn something about the amazing sort of history of literature and the arts and history in general. Um, and then things like Morning Edition, All Things Considered, Weekend Edition, Krista Tippett, Speaking of Faith, all of these things, even if you listen for five minutes here and there, you will learn something about this world. Um, a couple books have come out. Terry Gross has one. All I did was ask. And sort of transcripts of some of her conversations. And then Dave Isay has a book, Listening is an Act of Love, and it comes with a CD. And the first piece you're listening, you're basically crying. I mean, it's just so beautifully done and so nicely put together. Um, for Gary Schweitzer back here, I, I, I threw this one in, although I wasn't thinking of you when I wrote this, but if you don't read a newspaper, even online, I think you should. I think um, as a physician in this community, I know so many people. I cannot read the Star Tribune on a daily basis and not know personally somebody that's in there. Now, it might be an obituary, but in the sports section, the arts and entertainment, metro, front, it, it absolutely connects me. And I'll tell you, when I go into a room with a patient who's from Mogadishu, Somalia, and I can actually say something intelligent about, oh, so you were in a refugee camp in Kenya, and then from there did you go to Germany, like a lot of people do. I mean, it's just, it's the instant linkage. It's the thing that people love you for, and you will have this incredible loyalty if you can link. And you link through keeping up with current events. And I know everybody's busy, and we're all crazy busy. Um, and nobody gets the paper anymore. I know young people. I asked last fall. I asked the question. I said, "How many of you get like the paper delivered to you?" And like, out of eighty people, like three hands went up. And then I said, "Well, how many of you read it online?" It's like ten hands went up. How many of you watch Grey's Anatomy? All the hands went up. So if I can encourage something, it'd be like <laughs> read, the, read a read a paper. And my favorite is the New York Times, um, although I, I read the local stuff. And if you're interested, from a even if you got the paper one day a week and you go to Starbucks, grab the Tuesday New York Times. There's a whole Science Times section, which is so fascinating. Medical stories, doctor stories, research, in context, cool things happening. It, it would be well worth your buck 25 or whatever it was. Um, this I threw in here because I think that it's great to travel. It's great to speak another language. But you can only go so many places. But if you watch a foreign film, for an hour and a half, two hours, you were truly transported to another land, you're another place. This room, by the way, I think was where I used to come for the U Film Society years ago. Um, Bell Auditorium's over here. When they, that was not working, that we'd come in here. I, I, I'm almost positive this is a remodeled space. Um, and my parents started taking me in high school. And then in college, I started going on my own. And then when I was here as a medical student, I started watching these films. And right now, it's the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Film Festival, so the time is perfect. A lot of these films are over at the um, St. Anthony, Maine. But Oak Street Cinema, Walker Arts Center, Uptown Lagoon, Edina, sort of the landmark cinemas, they have this wonderful series going. Um, I think it's important to think visually. Every day I'm with patients. I'm thinking in terms of, you know, I'm describing asthma. Well, if I'm trying to tell them why they need to take their steroid inhaler, I will whip out a piece of paper and draw a circle, and I'll show like what a normal bronchial tube would look like. But when it's full of inflammation, and, and then I show, show it like this, and then if there's you know, sputum in there, and then it's like this. And so you've got this much airspace you're breathing through. 
it visually helps them connect and understand what you're talking about. So I think that, and I, I say this, that you should sketch and be able, you know, I can't draw worth crud. And I never took an art class, I never took a sketch class, but I'm very quick to whip out a piece of paper and draw something. And patients have taken those drawings with them and kept them. Um, this is a book I saw recently, and how could I resist buying a book? I mean, this is actually the book cover. It's uh, the back of the napkin, solving problems and selling ideas with pictures. And it looks, looks like a giant napkin, but it's brilliant. And he says, you know, if you can draw an arrow and a line and a box and a circle, you pretty, got it, you pretty much got it ma you know, mastered. And you don't have to do much more than that. But think visually. Use metaphors. Um, our language is so full of metaphor. But to say to somebody that, you know, congestive heart failure means your ejection fraction is like less than 40%. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. But if you say that your heart, think of it as a pump. And it's a pump that's running out of gas. And we need to help you put some fuel back in that heart. They can kind of understand that. They kind of know what that means. So you have to think about that. And you're thinking these things on the fly. Or you'll hear them once and you'll tuck it away and, and remember that. Um, you should develop a poet's ear or a photographer's eye. And the, way, the reason I say that is that the poets have this way of thinking about something. A little, a little scene. A little, a little action. And they have this amazing way of capturing it and, and retelling it. And a photographer, I think in many ways, is sort of a visual equivalent of poetry. It's like capturing one moment in time. And I think if you do that as a healthcare provider, it's a little Sherlock Holmesian, I suppose. It's like, you know, oh, I can tell you've been walking in the, you know, the heath because you've got this little purple thing on your, your shoe or something. But it hones your eye. And, and it's also the same kind of thing, too. Remember a little detail, and then it comes back the next time you see a patient. And it's these little, little things that, again, kind of cement that relationship. And it's also just fun, and it's part of this amazing privilege that we have. Um, I know I'm almost out of time, but this is a really, really short poem, and I want to read this because I think this kind of gets at this. John Stone, who I'm going to read this from, um, is a cardiologist. He's now retired. He was at Emory University Medical School, Grady Hospital, which is kind of like Hennepin County of Atlanta. And, and he wrote this one called Autopsy in the Form of an Elegy. In the chest, in the heart, was the vessel, was the pulse, was the art, was the love. Was the clot, small and slow, and the scar that could not know, the rest of you was very nearly perfect. Again, kind of capturing that little sort of thought. And obviously that came from an autopsy report. And as he's thinking about that, he's saying, oh, this person was so perfect, but it was just this clot in a blood vessel that caused this person's life to come to an end. Um, <laughs> this is my second audacious uh, recommendation here, and that is, if you've never read a graphic novel, I want you to read a graphic novel. Um, and, and for those who don't know, graphic novels are like comics, but they're in novel form. And it, it, at the very least, I want you to read widely. But I want you to, it just takes your brain in a different way, kind of taking the text and you're looking at image and you're putting them together. Um, if, you, if you want it, one that I could recommend if you just sort of enter into this world, Persepolis by Marjan uh, Satrapi, an Iranian woman living in Paris, is the one I recommend. Um, it is unbelievable. It, it, it explains the Iranian history. It gives you a completely different sense of the people that live there and everything we hear about with this axis of evil and all of that. Um, and you may recognize this. It was made into a film recently, which is unbelievable. But read the graphic novel first before you go to that. And um, if you've never gone to Big Brain Comics, this is my plug for Washington, this guy on Washington Avenue. It's one of my favorite independent bookstores in the Twin Cities. And then this gives you just one other idea, this book called Epileptic by David B. It's a French... Uh, artist, cartoonist, but it's all it's converted to English, it's translated. But amazing the way he tells you about his, his brother's struggle with this horrible, intractable epilepsy. My final two things here, um, it is so important to write well, to write clearly. And I know you probably have distribution requirements, but if you can take an expository writing class that you may not have taken, or take or go to a, a workshop, or take a class at you know, some place, it is so important, and, and you will be so thankful you did it. One of my top classes I, talk, I took at St. Olaf was um, expository writing with a guy named Verlin Klinkenberg, who now writes for the New York Times uh, editorial board. And truly, if I had to stack up all the courses in their worth, even as a physician, I think my expository writing class may be number one or, or certainly number two. And finally, listen well. Um, medicine, healthcare is unbelievably privileged. Um, I'm constantly awed by the fact that I actually get paid to listen to stories, if you think of it that way. I mean, I'm there to try and provide healing. I'm there to try and do good work. 
But honestly, every day, I go to work, I go into a room, it's just me and the patient, and I get to talk to them. And the people I've met have been Vietnam vets who walk with Martin Luther King um, in Selma, Alabama, who was a grunt in, in Vietnam, and now he's chemically dependent, to amazingly artistic, creative people, to everyone in between, and college professors, and, and other people in healthcare, and, and children, and newborns. It is unbelievable the opportunity we have, and it's all about stories, and listening, and connecting. So with that, I know um, we're hoping to have some Q&A time. It's exactly 6 o'clock or 6.01. Um, maybe we can, can I offer? I know people might have to leave as well. So how about this? I'll take a question or two right now if there are any. Otherwise, I'll be happy to stick around and, and chat with you afterward. Any questions? Well, let's do this then. Let's just, uh, we'll, we'll end there. Thank you for your attention. And I didn't cough, so I'm very happy about that. Thanks.